Though not many of us can say at a very young age, I know my purpose in life. I know exactly what I want to do and how to get there. That's normally a pretty long and circuitous road for most of us. But for some reason, I thought I was one of the lucky ones. So I said, I'm going to make it in New York City as a photojournalist with $1,500 in my bank account. So I moved to New York. And I did. I ended up getting jobs and working and supporting myself. I even met a man, fell in love, got married. I was living my personal and professional dream. And I said to myself in that cocky 20-year-old way, well, that wasn't so hard. Like, I don't really know what my mom was so nervous about. Until I got news that my father was gravely ill. And all these memories of a painful past came rushing back. And I wasn't ready for it. I had a very complicated relationship with my father. He was a very doting father, but he was an emotionally and physically abusive husband to my mother. For a while, I thought I grew up in a happy home because I had my mom and the rest of my family and friends to thank for. And I honestly forgot about my painful past when I left my dad's house and I stopped talking to him when I was a teenager. But when I got the phone call, all the memories came back, and I physically, emotionally, but also physically, could not handle it. I fell into a very deep depression. And prior to 2008, I didn't really know what depression was. I kind of used that word very casually, like, oh, it's a runner in my pantyhose, that's so depressing. But I didn't know it was a medical condition. I didn't know that there was a chemical shift in my brain that affected me physically as well. I couldn't get up. I didn't really want to eat, didn't want to get out of the house. My husband, Ben, actually had to shower me, feed me, bathe me. And it was such a confusing state because it wasn't as if I was trying to be lazy. I wanted to be lazy. I didn't but it felt like a sumo wrestler was sitting on my chest, and I could not physically fight from that gravitational pull. So my husband, who is a photojournalist as well, encouraged me to document what I was going through. He said that, that I should photograph and that I should write everything down, which was a really great idea because everything was so exhausting at that time and talking to my therapist was exhausting. I didn't want to do it. But for some reason, these tools that I had, my camera and my pen, were able to capture everything that I was feeling. I didn't have to tell my therapist what anxiety felt like. I just photographed it. And I thought that this was a good way for me to really study and understand the state that I was in. If only I could capture my thoughts and transfer that onto a piece of paper or translate my emotions and transfer that into a photographic print, then maybe I could study it with more distance and really understand this illness, this depression that I had. So I chronicled because it felt like I didn't have any other choice but to do this. It was survival for me. It was cathartic. And it was during this time that I got a phone call from my father. And perhaps it's because I just wasn't ready to face those emotions yet. I was still working through them. That I didn't answer his call. I let it go to voicemail. And when I finally was able to get up the courage and listen to the voicemail, I didn't understand what he was saying. It was very garbled. It was an overseas call. And I didn't call him back. So I didn't really know what he wanted to tell me. And I never could. I never would. Three days later, I got a call from my cousin saying that my father had died alone in his hospital room in the Philippines. 
And if I was sad before, I had what my therapist called a double dip. This time, this time I was numb. I did not feel anything. My world was hazy. There was a disconnect between my physical self and the rest of the world. If my husband Ben kissed me on a good day, maybe I would feel the warmth of his cheeks. But that would not really register as love or tenderness. And the worst thing, the worst thing about feeling like you're dead inside is understanding that you're sober enough and conscious enough to live through that. And so I cut. I cut not because it was a cry for help. I cut because I needed to remind myself that I could still feel. My husband started his career as a photojournalist in Iraq when he was 23. So I've never really seen fear in that man. But on this day, when he tried to jimmy the door with a butter knife, and he barged into the room, and he grabbed my hand, he took the knife away, and he was screaming, what are you doing? This is your life? This is your friends, your family, this is an art? That's sick. And I did what any rational person would do. I put my camera down. I picked up my pen and I wrote, what are you doing? This is your life. This is your family. This is your friend. It was a very hazy moment for me and it took me a while actually years when I looked at this image again, that I realized how utterly terrifying and lonely this must have been for Ben. This was the first time that he finally decided to call my doctor and commit me to the psych ward. When I first took this image, it was purely as a study. Again, I wanted to understand the state that I was in. And I wanted to see what I must have looked like from the perspective of where my mother was standing, just as a study. And I didn't really see, see this image again until years later when I became a mother myself. And I became racked with guilt because what that must have felt like for my mother to see her youngest daughter wanting to just give up. I didn't fully appreciate the fear and the pain that must have been for her. She never left my side. He never left my side either. Ben was always with me, even in the bathroom. Didn't matter what I was doing. He was so scared. Spud didn't even ask to be walked. He didn't ask to feed. He just stayed with me. He wouldn't go anywhere. So I continued to document. Even in the psych ward, I would jot down these conversations that I had with everyone until this was no longer my story. I started sharing it in group. And someone in therapy actually said, you know what, Marvy? Hearing your words make me feel like I belong. And that meant a lot to me, because that's what group therapy was for me. I no longer felt like an anomaly. I was with people who knew exactly what it felt like to be depressed. And I realized that there were more people who needed this, who needed to express themselves because they needed that companionship. And that's how One in 20 was born. One in 20 is a gathering of people who have been touched by mental illness, whether you are a sufferer or a caregiver, 
a suicide survivor or a lost survivor. One in 20 is a space for people to express themselves free of judgment and free of stigma. It was essentially an experiment on empathy and self-expression that would live on social media. And one of the submissions that really stuck with me was Eric's submission. And it was a series of questions about his son Joshua, who he lost at the age of three. And I'm going to read you a few lines from Eric's submission. If I had gone to his room five minutes early, would he still be there? Is it okay to go days at a time and not think about him? Is it okay for me to be so happy in life? How do I answer a stranger who asks how many children I have? Eric's story resonated with me because it made me feel guilty. As much as I love my children, as scared I am to have the experience that Eric had, for some reason, I felt trapped in this world that I was in. I was now a new mother of two. I had left photojournalism. I sold all my cameras. That purpose that I thought I had, so cocky as a 20-year-old, was no longer. And I was lost. And I was navigating motherhood in a culture that really didn't practice it as a communal effort. I didn't have my camera, but I still had my phone because this is past 2008, and yay, iPhone technology. So I went back to what I knew how to do. The only thing I really knew how to do, which was tell stories. And I documented. But my world was dark. Even playtime with Captain America and Wolverine was dark. Nap time was lonely. My world was still hazy, and even nighttime routines like brushing their teeth was an arduous task. But inspired by 1 in 20, I decided not just to document what I was going through, but I wanted to share it to the world. I was reaching out for a community who could understand what it was like to be a parent or to be a caregiver and know what the loneliness was like. To be in constant anxiety of the safety of your children. To know what the growing pains of a marriage looks like. You know, when I was sick in 2008, Spud was with me all the time. And I had another dog, Wheat. And I had no idea where Wheat was. No idea. I just thought he didn't care because he was a dog after all. And it wasn't until after his last breath when I heard my husband wail, I turned around and he was collapsed. And I realized that Wheat wasn't with me because Wheat was taking care of Ben. So I did it again. I forgot to say thank you again. And how do you parent during that time when your body is so racked with guilt that you can barely function? What do you say to your seven-year-old? How do you explain to him to just embrace death as a part of life? How do you face your own mortality and his when he says, Mommy, I don't want to die. I don't want to die because if I die, my eyes will die. And if my eyes die, I will no longer see you. And if I don't see you, I'll forget you. And if I forget you, I will stop loving you. And I just cannot stop loving you, Mommy. 
What do you say? So I reached out. I reached out to my community of parents. And somehow the fog lifted. And I started seeing light all over again. And for some of you who are photographers, that's a big thing. And I started appreciating my children for the little people that they were becoming. They started to talk and reason. And they were actually really funny. I even enjoyed the quiet. I marveled at how strange they were, like really strange. <laughs> I wasn't as rattled by their cries anymore because they were normally in costumes when that happened and that helped. And I brushed off a lot, some, of the daily challenges. I even owned this new identity that I had. I was no longer the dark, brooding artist. I was now the mom who thought cheesy yearbook photos were really, really cool. And I started to see my husband again not just as a father, but as my life partner. And I soaked them all in. And it took a really long time to heal. But it wasn't as daunting, because I knew that I was going through this journey with a community behind me. Thank you.